Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcade Economics. Excited to have everyone who has joined us for this live call as we're going to be talking about some of the recent updates from Fortuna Silver as it's been quite a busy year and quite a busy couple of months since we last talked following the release of the second quarter earnings, although they have quite a few news developments which we'll be digging into, including recent closing of the Chesser Resources deal, also some drilling and exploration updates, some more progress at Seguela. So excited to dig in today. I'm joined, as always, by Jorge Ganoza, the CEO of Fortuna. Jorge, it's great to have you here with us today. How are you, my friend? Pleasure to be here, Chris. Well, good to have you here and certainly a lot to discuss. And as always, joining us from the mining analyst side is Dave Pranzler, Investment Research Dynamics, in front of his beautiful Fortuna Silver Coins. Good morning, Dave. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. And I might add, this is a live call, so looking forward to taking questions. You can type those in the chat, and we'll open it up to some live Q&A in just a little bit. Although, Jorge, plenty to talk about, yet I thought we might start with the recent news that you had out just one week ago today, which was the closing of the deal that you guys did for Chesser Resources, initially announced back in May, now finally closed. And perhaps you could just walk us through any updates there. Um, I know people are familiar with the deal who have been following the company for a while, but um, you know anything along the lines of, again, reiterating what led you to the deal? I know it's an asset you guys were looking at for a while, but perhaps we could start there at Chesser Resources. Yes, Chesser is a very exciting uh, exploration opportunity that we are adding to our portfolio. It's an advanced exploration opportunity. Uh, Chesser Resources, which is an Australian, or we used to be, now we acquired it, uh, uh, an Australian exploration company, uh, managed to successfully advance uh, over a short period of time, two years, Chesser, uh, the Diambasut project from, from a concept to around 850,000 ounces of gold uh, in a in a most exciting area, uh, the Diambasut project sits at the at the heart of the dia of the Senegalese Mali shear zone, which is a major structural feature that hosts some of the most uh, uh, relevant uh, deposits, gold deposits in 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 West Africa, the Lulo Gunkoto mines that belong to Barrick. Uh, the Fecola mine that belongs to B2Gold, and uh, the Ambassad sits right in the middle of all of that. Uh, Chesser, uh, even though you know it, it struggled to fund the project in this most difficult market, managed, as I said, to successfully develop uh, close to a million ounces of gold on a on a short period of time. So. For us, this is an exciting exploration opportunity, and we believe that under under the Fortuna umbrella, with you know more funding capabilities, uh, we have a good chance of of making the Ambassador significantly larger. So it is an, as I said, an advanced exploration project. Uh, a priority in 2024 will be a priority for our exploration budgets. Uh, and you know, and we look forward to continue reporting on, on our work there and, and hopefully our success in advancing the Ambassador. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned in there that one of the things you're looking forward to do is growing that resource. And perhaps you could just touch a little bit on the drilling plans going forward and what is lined up on the timeline there. Uh, you know, we, we're mobilizing drill rigs as we speak, so you know we're not going to drag our feet on this one. We we believe it's a high value exploration opportunity that we want to hit hard. Um, but I would say that over the next 15, 18 months, you'll see us uh, allocating roughly twelve million dollars to exploration at wow. this one property. Yeah. And are you at this point able to have any rough guess on what a timeline into production might be there? 
you know, even though Chesser developed a preliminary economic assessment and was doing work, engineering work, conductive to publishing a preliminary feasibility study, we, for us, is not at that stage yet. You know, Fortuna would not develop a, a sub-million ounce deposit, let's put it like that. So we, you know, it was a, a very, uh, you know, uh, I, want, I don't want to call it cheap deal, but it was an inexpensive deal for us uh, that bears little financial risk to the company, but has some corresponding geologic risk because we need to take this deposit to over a million ounces before we uh, contemplate a construction decision. So there's still work that needs to be done to get there. As I said, we are not dragging our feet. We're putting the money uh, on exploration and, and a well-funded exploration program. So I would say that second half of next year, we should be in uh, with results on hand from the exploration program. We should be in a position to assess where we are at. No, hopefully, we have crossed uh, uh, the the million ounce mark, and uh, we have uh, options to either continue exploring, depending on what we see, or advance the engineering. But uh, the discussions around engineering are discussions that will start taking place uh, probably in the second half of next year. Okay, that makes sense. And obviously, in the past couple of years, you guys have expanded your presence in West Africa, so a region that you have become quite familiar with, although country by country, obviously, the government and politics differs quite a bit. For people who might not be as familiar with the jurisdictional risks in Senegal, perhaps you could just touch on that and let people know what you've seen in your time there, what made you feel comfortable with the deal, and Anything else you could share about the jurisdiction? Yes, you know, I would say that today the more stable uh, pro business countries in the West African region are Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, and Senegal, right? So the Ambassador, the Chester acquisition, is uh, based located in Senegal. So we, we are anchored right now in these two, uh, you know, stable, relatively stable jurisdictions, uh, these two countries, and, and, and we're very comfortable uh, continuing to, to expand our West African business in these two countries. We also have an operating mine in Burkina Faso. Uh, you know, Burkina Faso, Today is going through through security uh, concerns and, uh, and and political turmoil. Uh, we're happy to keep our business running there, but we are not looking to expand our investments in in Burkina Faso. We have good dialogue with authorities in Burkina Faso. We we uh, are quite sympathetic to the challenges the government faces. Uh, and I would say that uh, the government is very uh, supportive of, of, of our presence, uh, providing security, intelligence, but uh, certainly Burkina Faso, Mali uh, are, are not countries where we're looking to expand our business, no. Okay, and Dave, before we move on from Chester, did you have any questions on Chester you'd like to go through? Just a couple of quick ones. Um, Jorge, uh, has there been any met work done on the deposit? Yes, yes, there's been extensive metallurgical work done. Uh, there is a process uh, design that is uh, complete. So I would say that on the engineering side, probably where most attention has been uh, focused is, is met work. So, uh, uh, yeah, we're very comfortable that, you know, is your everyday type run of the mill orogenic type gold deposit, no refractory or no, no issues like that. 
none that we have identified up to now. And uh, uh, like we say in, in, in mineral processing, it's a very sweet ore. So, um, I mean, given that, you know, if assuming you're probably, I'm guessing, just me jumping the gun here, there probably will eventually be a, a positive construction decision. I'm confident in your, in your uh, exploration team. Are you, will you be able to, um, since you're not going to need, probably you're not going to need to raise financing to build the mine, you can probably do, I'm guessing out of free cash flow. Um, are you going to need to spend the money on a formal feasibility study or do you, can you just knock out the advanced engineering work and make a decision without spending the money on a feasibility study? You know, uh... A feasibility study is always good discipline. Uh, producing a feasibility study is always good discipline. Uh, now, sometimes companies develop studies, uh, uh, how can I say it, uh, to, to, to meet market uh, uh, demands or whatever. What we view it is 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 good discipline, no? Uh, I, you know, before we, I, I will even go further. Before making a formal construction decision, I think we have the luxury of not only doing a feasibility study, which entails providing at least basic engineering, but I would even go further and, and develop detailed engineering on various aspects of the design. Uh, to provide, provide more certainty to our budget, right? So uh, I, I think it's good discipline, no? Uh, when we bypass certain steps, and sometimes we want to do that, for example, for certain reasons, you might want to fast track it or whatever. Uh, but, you know, I uh, for, for something like, like the Ambassad, I would think... Uh, uh, you know, uh, slowly but but steady, you know, and and uh, and uh, do the good, good good work. Don't do some don't do shortcuts because we don't have to, right? Sometimes you do shortcuts because you're tight on financing, and and that is not that doesn't mean being dispendious with the money, but it is good discipline to do a feasibility study. And again, I would like to advance detailed engineering on many areas before I make a formal construction decision that will help tighten the budget more, right? All right, Dave, any other Chester questions before we move on or Jorge, any other comments on Chester that we didn't get to already that you'd like folks to know about? No, I think we touched on the main ones. Uh, uh, it, is, it is a small acquisition for Fortuna, but one that uh, we're very excited about. Okay, well, certainly will be nice to see that develop and add another resource into your portfolio there. Um, obviously, something else that we've talked quite a bit about has been the construction of the mine at Seguela, which seems like basically everything has been completed now. You recently had an inauguration ceremony at Seguela, and nice to see that you're meeting with some of the officials. I remember when we were doing our visit there, they have an official for every gold pour. And additionally, you've also completed the process plant performance testing. So it's now like everything is pretty much online there. Is that basically the stage that it's at? And I, I know that now the focus shifts a little bit, but anything you could touch on as things have wrapped up in the construction at Seguela? No, we're just very pleased with the performance of our Seguela team in delivering on time, on budget, a construction. Uh, this month of September is the two-year anniversary since we made the construction decision uh, back in September 2021. So, uh, you know, to, to be here today, two years later, with the mine operating as per design at full rate capacity, meeting and exceeding expectations. Uh, the, the inauguration was a big event, around 1,500 uh, uh, villagers and, and authorities uh, joining together with us uh, in celebration of this milestone. 
So, so uh, you know, uh, what can I say? But more importantly, Seguela is a turning point for Fortuna. Seguela will be re we will be reporting consolidated results for the first time incorporating this new mine in the third quarter, this quarter. This quarter comes to an end uh, this month of September, and we will be reporting the quarter in early November. But, uh, you know, where you, what you should expect to see is the renewed strength of the business. This mine alone contributes 40%, roughly 40% of our cash flows, uh, of our free cash flow. So, so it's an important flagship asset and I cannot underscore enough how relevant it is to Fortuna in moving forward, right? Yeah. yeah, and it really seems like everything went quite well, certainly on time and on budget. Were, were you surprised almost that there weren't, not that everything, not that there were not hurdles that you guys were overcoming, but in terms of your experience in building mines, was this about as smooth as one could hope for? You know, every time you build, you you learn, and you never stop learning, right? Live and learn. So uh, in Seguela, we put behind it, you know, years and years of 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 experience, of collective experience. It's not just me, of course. It's it's a a whole team of people. Uh, so uh, good planning. You know, we were just talking about that with uh, Dave regarding, uh, you know, making shortcuts and, and not. So we had a really robust, strong planning, uh, the right team. Uh, so good construction partners. Uh, all of that came together in, in, in delivering a successful project, right? So, uh, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. You know, I would be lying if I said that there were no headaches or, or, or challenges. Of course, there are. It's a construction, and it goes on for almost two years. But, uh, but all of them were were properly identified, uh, resolved, and and uh, here we have a, a most exciting project for the future of the company, right? Uh, again, I cannot underscore enough how relevant Seguela is. And I am quite excited because it is only now in the second half of the year, in the second half of the year, that you will start seeing the renewed strength. We're in a position to boost our uh, production by 45%. Wow. Boost our margins. Uh, boost or, or sales, boost or margins. So uh, again, uh, I'm very, I'm really looking forward and anxious to report third quarter results. No, and and show you all of this. Have you set a date for the release of uh, the third quarter? It's uh, I believe November 9th or board meeting for the okay. approval of financials. So. Around the 10th, 11th, you should see. Now, yeah. uh, next, uh, in the coming days, after uh, September end, so first days of October, you'll get a, a sneak preview because we also, we pre-release uh, production results for the quarter. So you will see there uh, the the really the key metrics that drive the financial numbers, which is the ounces produced, right? You start getting a sense for what I mean. And what is the timeline to incorporate Sunbird as well as extending the life of mine? I know that's been uh, one of the key steps that you guys are looking forward to. Is that still on track for October or what, what are we looking yeah, at? Yeah, we, we are working on... Uh, on the Sandberg conversion, as you know, the drilling is done, so it's in the hands of the mine planning team. Uh, in fact, I have a review on Friday with the team on, on the advance of that work. So, no, it, that's advancing. Okay. Dave, did you have some questions on Seguela? 
Just one quick one. Um, what's your exploration budget there for the next 12 months? Have you set that yet? Well, for 2023, we had around eight and a half, nine million dollars in exploration funding allocated to, to Seguela. Uh, and for 2024, you should think of a similar number. No? Okay. Is that that's going to be primarily uh, resource expansion drilling or um, exploration drilling or both? Well, we have a bit of everything huh? because we have uh, we're drilling in the in 2024. You'll see us doing a lot of drilling on the deep extents of the pits for underground resources. Mm. Now we we need to still do work optimizing really how deep we drive those pits versus when going underground. So, so you're gonna see us doing more focused drilling on the bottom of those pits, the ANCN, Kula, Antenna even, uh, Sandbird for sure, uh, all of those pits, right? Then uh, we have multiple targets, uh, Barana, Badior, Kestro, P11, Gabro North. I mean, you will see us moving systematically throughout all of those targets. So we have several programs going on at the same time, right? Testing the bigger property package and then working closer to existing resources, right? Just one more quick question. Um, as you move underground with the ore, does that change the metallurgy or is it still pretty no. simple? No, no, it's the same, wow. same, same metal. Yeah. It's We're completely in, uh, different than a Carlin resource, Carlin trend resource. Yes, yes, absolutely. These are orogenic type ore bodies, orogenic type loads. Uh, you know, they tend to be quite, uh, not always, not always, but tend to be, uh, the large majority tend to be quite uh, amenable to conventional CIL. Uh, we don't uh, find, uh, you know, deleterious elements or complex metallurgy. It's a uh, free milling or gold, right? That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we like from the project is the exploration potential, the sweet type of ore that allows to use your very conventional carbon in leach, uh, mineral processing, uh, no two stage. It's basically one single stage crushing and uh, sag milling, and and then you're freeing the gold, right? So we recover forty percent of the gold with the gravimetry. And the balance, the 60% goes through carbon in leach, but to recover 40% of the gold uh, with the gravimetric uh, means, it tells you a lot about, you know, how, how uh, sweet the ore is, right? Yes. And Jorge, what's the, pro uh, the process like in terms of bringing some of the other targets into production? Is there a point where you get to that you don't want to have too many of them into production at the same time and it gets too busy? Or what is the metrics that you're looking at in terms of the order? Just to give you a sense there, Chris, antenna, which you see there close to the plant, the, a bit south of the plant, the antenna pit, that is a 400,000 ounce resource that is the anchor of production for the next few years. So antenna is, is an anchor to production and then is complemented with production coming from ANCIEN and subsequently from KULA. So you will have at any given time, at least two pits in operation. Antenna sourcing the bulk of uh, mill feed supplemented by ANCIEN first, and then transitioning to KULA. So it's antenna, ANCIEN, antenna, KULA. That's the, the sequence over the coming, you know, couple of years. Okay. And uh, any of the other targets that you're particularly excited about now? I know one of the things that you mentioned when we were back there in our visit was that rather than being in a situation where not 
having something to explore or drill. You guys had your hands full with different prospects on the Seguela location. Anything else uh, or any of these in particular that have, have you excited right now? Well, we, we had a lot of success in the north with the Barana and Badior. So we, we, we were excited about that. We finished a round of drilling and we're digesting the data. And then uh, in the south, uh, Kestrel, uh, P1, all of those are you know targets that uh, we have in front of us right now. We're drilling where... You know, we look forward to put out some news releases on 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 the results we got. We're just waiting for one last batch of results in the next coming couple of weeks, and we'll likely be publishing something. And that will help you get a, a sense for for you know how systematic exploration continues providing opportunity, right? Yep, and certainly a good position to be in. Dave, did you have any other Seguela questions for us today? No, that, that does it for me. You know, what, what I've been pushing with, with our investors, with our, our shareholders, is um, the concept of time to harvest, right? So uh, now that the construction is over, now that Seguela is operating at you know full throttle, it's time to harvest. So capital allocation becomes a key issue for us. And uh, if one, you'll start seeing us paying down debt. Uh, Fortuna is not a highly leveraged company in terms of debt, where debt to EBITDA ratio is under, under one. Uh, we have about $240 million in our syndicated credit facility. But you'll start seeing us aggressively paying that down. I believe a mining company needs to be run with a fortress balance sheet. So you start seeing us aggressively paying that. And uh, also, uh, you know, being opportunistic around buybacks with such a depressed share price, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I know those were two questions we had last time when we did our call. So good to hear the update there. Uh, another thing that you guys recently mentioned was you had some drill results over at the San Jose mine in Mexico, where you're getting also higher gold to silver ratio as compared to the rest of San Jose, lower base metals. And perhaps you could just walk us through the drill results and also give us a understanding of what that indicates when you are getting a different ratio of the metals that you're finding there. Yes, you know, to begin with, uh... You know, we enjoyed a lot of exploration success some five years ago at the San Jose mine, five, six years ago. And uh, that led to the expansion of the mine and, and everything. But since then, we've been in, in, in a sort of a dry spell with respect to exploration results. No, I mean, we've been finding ore. We are finding extensions of mineralizations, but never enough really to balance depletion on, uh, on, on every year. So we've been depleting the mine. What we've been able to do is slow down the rate of depletion, but the mine's been depleting. Uh, and all of a sudden we made this uh, blind discovery. The Yesi vein is a blind structure uh, and we hit, you know, close to 10 meters at 1.3 uh, kilos of silver equivalents per ton. So we're quite excited. Still early days, still early days. Uh, but we're quite excited about what it means uh, because it opens the door. Being it a, a blind discovery uh, in the immediate area of the mine. I think speaks to the opportunities that we might still have around us. So we are hitting this one hard as well. Uh, we have two drill rigs turning, one from surface, one from the underground, trying to, to find the dimension of this mineralized shoot, high-grade shoot. Uh, it would, it, we could easily integrate it to production. So we're drilling it hard to see you know, how meaningful it is. From from the discovery perspective, it's the most exciting discovery. Now we need to quantify this and see how meaningful it could be to production. 
right? So we need to transition from a successful discovery into something that can really uh, impact the bottom line with high grade ounces running through the mill. And how many of those we'll, find, we'll have? No doubt that we have something there. Uh, the question is how big? Right. What What is the timeline and the, the details on the drilling program? I know you're still ongoing there and any thoughts on how long you might be able to extend the life of mine uh, going forward? You know, as I said, we need to have a sense of dimension. The San Jose mine has reserves to operate until 2026. So we are currently, you know, working at an accelerated pace to define the size of this. I couldn't tell you uh, if this is something that uh, can uh, support uh, six months of mining or six years of mining, right? Like I, at this stage, I cannot tell you that. I need time and, 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 and that time is measured in months, probably in six to eight months, we'll have a good sense for what this means, right? And, and, and hopefully come up with something that we can integrate to our mining plan and mining schedules. Okay, and as you've gone along there, something obviously everyone in the mining community is becoming aware of not getting necessarily easier to meet the regulations with Mexico. Have there been any observations or anything you've noticed or any hurdles there in terms of the current mining proposals that they have on underway there? Yeah, you know, the, the Mexican law that Congress passed is being challenged in the courts by the same, by the opposition in Congress and several mining companies as included. Uh, you know, we can always think that uh, laws can be improved, but certainly the, the, what Congress approved had a lot of very, very negative aspects for the industry as a whole, right? To begin with, it prohibits, basically prohibits a, a private exploration, it reserves exploration for the state. So uh, in new ground, in open ground, right? So, you know, things like that. Uh, but it, 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 the, the, the law was contested by the opposition in Congress and uh, we still need to hear from the court on, on that ruling. So it could very well be that uh, the the law is sent back to Congress, uh, like it has happened with other uh, in, in initiatives uh, coming out of of Congress, like uh, you know the energy sector and, and and other aspects of Mexican law that didn't pass and they were stopped by by the judicial system, right? Okay, well, certainly will be interesting to see how things progress in Mexico going forward. We've seen, obviously, the Penasquito mine on strike and saw the recent numbers shows that there's been quite a decline in the mining output. Another thing I was curious to get your comment on, something people have seen uh, in the silver community recently, but this was from the U.S. Geological Survey. And they show that Mexico, with reserves of 37,000 tons, which at the current mining rate lasts for about six years, obviously there are new projects ongoing, although, again, with the dynamics that you just mentioned going on in Mexico, we'll, we'll see in due time how much additional uh, production or, or, or studies or resources are found. Any thoughts on whether those numbers sound about right to you and whether we'll continue to see Mexico be the largest producer of silver going forward. You know, uh, Mexico has a long and proud mining tradition. And I believe that uh, uh, most companies, as included, continue to have a positive uh, long-term view on, on the country. No? I think the negative uh, tone that this this uh, administration has put on on mining uh, is transitory. Uh, that's an expectation. 
mining in Mexico is is part of its history and its heritage, right? So, uh, as I said, of course, there are always things uh, we can improve and and laws can be always improved, but. Uh, you know, it's 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 uh, difficult to see uh, such an important mine like Peñasquito in this uh, union struggle and whatnot. But unfortunately, those things are not new to Mexico, right? Uh, so uh, long term, we're positive on Mexico. Uh, short term, we're we're cautiously optimistic. Okay, Dave. Any questions on San Jose or Mexico or otherwise? <laughs> Just really quickly, when you refer to the, the Yesi discovery as a blind vein, was that, I mean, was that a wildcat hole or did you guys have a hunch based on the way the mineralization is distributed on the property? I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story. Uh, we have a, a young geologist. Her name is Jessica. She's a young geologist. She's been working with us for 12 years. So she she's probably in her early 30s. Wow. Uh, yeah, in her early 30s. Uh, and she was put in charge of a drill rig underground testing a known vein called uh, Victoria, which we are drilling and Victoria is already part of our, of our mine plans. Victoria is a vein we discovered some four years, five years ago. So in, in doing the Victoria drilling, she intersected the Victoria vein, which was her mandate. She was instructed to drill, you know, and, and uh, under a plan to, to quantify resources in, in Victoria. But she noticed that there was persistent alteration on the other side of the vein. Once the drill hole pierced the vein, she decided not to stop the drilling because of the alteration she identified in the core. So she let the drill hole run for additional 200 meters, which is a lot. Uh, that's, uh, you know, probably six days of drilling. No, doing 40 meters per shift with core drilling, horizontal core drilling. But she let the drill run until she said, I'll let it run until we are out of the alteration zone. And uh, on the last meters of the alteration zone, the, the drilling intersected the Yesi vein with 10 meters at 1.3 kilos. Wow. <laughs> so I decided uh, there with the team that we were discussing. So we, this is a blind discovery because that vein doesn't outcrop on surface. So uh, I said, have you guys named this vein? And they said, not yet. Well, you know, the vein should be named in honor of Jessica, who is the one who, you know, with this uh, good sense and uh, geologic sense, uh, decided not to stop where she was dictated to by the program drilled the Victoria vein. So she drilled and stopped, no? No, she, she was curious, inquisitive, a risk taker, and continued to drill for additional four or five days until she made the blind discovery of the of the, of the Yesi vein that bear her, bears her name. So, uh, yeah, I think we we not only deserve gratitude, but, but, a, but a nice bonus to Yesi. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. So, I get it now. So this, this, so you need to figure out how the how the vein, the geometry of the vein, kind of how deep it goes, how wide it is. I mean, yes. with that with that kind of grading, and I'm not saying this is gonna you're gonna this will be the case, but it, this could be a big rich vein, right? You know, it's not every day that you intersect 10 meters with 1.3 kilos. And, and uh, I ask a non-geologic question to you. What do you think are the odds that we hit the vein in the best single spot? That's a, I didn't even think about that, but that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, you, don't have to be a geologist. you don't have to be a geologist to say, okay, what were almost my chances? Almost zero that you hit the that vein in the best spot on the first shot when it was blind. 
if, I, if, I'm, if I'm blindfolded and, and throwing the darts that I hit it in the boo in the first time. I so, saw you throw I, darts. You probably would hit the wall, not the dartboard. <laughs> yes. Well, that, that, oh, we lost your audio there, Jorge. We still don't have your audio, Jorge. Sorry. I, there we I, go. We need to drill methodically and, and get a sense for, for size and, and shape and how many uh, ounces. And really, again, this is something that, uh, that uh, how, how we should view things. This is an exciting discovery but not necessarily exciting discoveries turn into exciting minds. Right. Uh, this is an exciting discovery. It's the first step. Now we, sit needing, we need to see how this ex exciting discovery is going to contribute to the mind. Hopefully, it will be an exciting contributor to the mind as well, right? We need to transition from discovery to uh, an exciting mining case, right? Okay. Uh, Dave, uh, any follow-up questions on that? No, I'm just excited to see more drill results from uh, from Yessi. Yeah, 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 absolutely. We are all in the same boat. <laughs> I <laughs> ask every other day. I ask every other day for results. <laughs> are you able to offer a rough timeline on when there may be additional results coming out on that yet? Or is it still a little bit too early? You know, we it is not going to help if, if we publish, you know, two drill, two drill, two drill holes. You know, so probably we want to group a number of, of results that help uh, investors uh, get a sense for size. No, I think we it's clear we made a discovery. It's clear it's an exciting discovery. Now I, I would like to instead of giving you two results or three, give you something that answers this question that you guys have been posting to me. You know, how meaningful is this for production? So I, uh, it's probably is gonna be some time measured in, in, in perhaps a couple of months until we can put out an initial approximation to how meaningful this is to production, right? Okay, appreciate that update. And we had a question come in from the audience. Someone is concerned about the possibility of mine nationalization in Mexico. Is that something that you see things in some environment could get to that point? If that did occur, are there steps that can be taken? Uh, any thoughts on that? I, I see that as far and remote. No, I, I really don't see that as a possibility. The, again, the current uh, government the current administration is a year. The current the, we have elections in Mexico in mid 2024, and the president leaves office in December. Uh, I I don't see that in the agenda at all. I I just don't. What I think is is the the, the general attitude of the government towards mining is 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 not positive. It's not constructive, right? So we get uh, consistent delays on permits. Uh, this new mining law that was passed, which uh, you know challenges uh, many aspects of the business, but nothing close to a nationalization. No, no, not at all. I don't see that. Okay, so certainly would have some consequences if they did try to do something like that and obviously mining quite, quite an industry in, in Mexico so yeah to begin with they're part of NAFTA they are all sorts of you know uh, you know uh, agreements and 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 things so so I, I I just don't see that as a as a plausible scenario no I don't Okay, makes enough sense. And uh, I guess the uh, next big event we'll have, you mentioned earnings for the third quarter coming up early November. So we'll be looking forward to going through those. Before we wrap up, Dave, did you have any final questions you wanted to run by Jorge today? Um, yeah, 
Well, you mentioned earnings, but we'll get the production update for the third quarter way before earnings. I, and I know you mentioned when it was going to be released, but when is that again, approximately? First, first uh, week of uh, October, oh. early days of October. Yeah. So that's, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that because uh, I want to see what Segala is doing. Yeah. No, we, we gave you more than two thirds of the answer to that in our uh, September news release when we released production for June, July, and August, right? We're only missing one month for the quarter, which is September. Uh, so so we already partially answered that question to, 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 to everybody. Uh, but you know we're we're very excited. It's looking very strong, uh, and uh, yeah, you, you know I I think uh, it is in, in spite of this uh, terrible equities market uh, or mining equities market, uh, you, you know the the company is doing great. Our business is doing great. Fortuna has never been in a, such a strong stronger position, really, ever. And Jorge, one uh, final question on something you just mentioned there, obviously has been a challenging mining equities market. I know you've been going to and attending several conferences recently. Any uh, Anything you could pass along from the sentiment of mining investors as well as outside of the U.S.? Any indications for optimism? Are people still waiting on the Fed to stop their interest rate hikes? Uh, or any thoughts from the conversations you've had? You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm mixed messages. Uh, I think the overarching theme is that we don't see large capital flows into the gold sector, uh, in, into the metal, and therefore nothing comes down to, to, to mining companies, right? I believe that the prices, the price of gold holding around $1,900, probably is a, a big uh, outcome of, of central banks buying, but central banks will buy gold, but not mining equities, right? So uh, I, I just don't, don't see a lot of, you know, uh, managed capital flowing into gold yet. Uh, and it's perhaps, perhaps, no, this is a speculation was supporting the gold price. It's just central banks that have been quite active and, and acquiring gold at record pace over the last quarters, right? Uh, but again, central banks buy gold, but don't buy mining equities. <laughs> so this is probably the worst uh, uh, market for mining equities that I've seen in my 30 years uh, active in the sector. Uh, by far the worst. You know, 2000 was very bad. 2001, 2002 were very bad years. But a uh, gold price was trading at $300, not 1900, right? Uh, so I think uh, uh, precious metals investors uh, have been put to the test, right? Uh, it's not, not 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 easy for us, certainly. Uh, but I I so I see portfolio managers with less money, but very very uh, inquisitive about good opportunities, and 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 trying to position themselves in companies that can tolerate volatility. Uh, we at the Colorado uh, Golf Forum at the Colorado Springs, you know, Golf Forum. We had uh, three full days of meetings, very good meetings. Uh, I understand that uh, the general tone of the conference was down with low attendance, but we at Fortuna had uh, three full days of meetings. Well, that's interesting to hear that you mentioned in the 30 years you've been doing this, this might be the toughest mining equities market, especially since 
gold still not all that far off of its all-time highs. Silver, well, not trending higher, is still, I mean, when we compare it to this time last year, still four or five dollars higher than when we dip below eighteen dollars. So uh will be interesting to see what happens when we finally see a bit of an upturn in the market in metals I, and hopefully will be good times. Yeah, I, I think the, the key thing here is that uh, when we see a turn, it will be from a quite a high base, right? Uh, you know, we are not going to be rebounding from $200. We're going to be rebound, rebound, re, uh, bouncing for, from, uh, you know, nominal highs of $1,800, $1, right? So, uh, uh, you know, I, I watch the dollar index. Uh, you know, if... if uh, we look at where the dollar index is today and the dollar index was in 2020, in, in 2000, you know, gold price is doing really quite well and probably supported by central bank buying, uh, right? By central bank buying. Yeah, it's well said because especially with the recent rally in the dollar index that we've seen since early July, I know people want a higher gold price, although given some of the conditions with the higher rates, higher dollar price, I think could could have been worse for gold and silver based on Absolutely. where we are now. Um, again, I get Absolutely. it. People, people want to see the higher price yet. Just putting it in context, hopefully uh, helps that a little bit. So, um, Jorge, before we wrap up, any final comments or anything else you'd like to touch on that perhaps we did not discuss today? No, oh, the message is Fortuna has never been as strong as it is today financially with uh, reserves, production, and, and we're at a turning point with Seguela in its first quarter reporting results. So please look for that. Look out for that. All right. Well, I appreciate you both joining me here today and also everyone who has been watching along at home. Again, you can find out more about Fortuna at fortunasilver.com where you can find out about all the different projects. Certainly there's that contact tab there if anyone has any questions would like to get in touch with management. So thank you, Jorge, for being here with us today and congratulations on continuing to move things forward. And of course, Dave Kranzler, who can be found at Investment Research Dynamics, where he publishes the Mining Stock Journal as well as the Short Sellers Journal, does a lot of coverage on Fortuna Silver in his Mining Stock Journal. So certainly a very helpful resource in navigating a complex sector, but fortunately we have experts like Dave out there. So with that said, going to wrap up today, but thanks again, everyone for joining us and we'll look forward to doing this again soon, probably in November after the results are released. So take care everybody.